Hello, my name is Matt Max. This is the first lecture of the video editing section. Today, I want to talk about the right computer for video editing and encoding. No matter whether you want to upgrade your existing machine or build a completely new one, there are a couple of really important details you have to keep your eye on. We all know that computers change really quickly, so it doesn't really make sense for me to give you specific specs. But what I can do is I can give you basic design guidelines for a computer built for video encoding and editing. The three main parts that are important for this are CPU, hard drives, and RAM in that order. Hard drives are probably more important than RAM. Everyone always forgets about hard drives, which is why I shall start with that exact topic. So what's the big deal about hard drives? You need to CPU that is able to do the video encoding. You need RAM because RAM is good. But what about hard drives? Well, where do your source files come from? Where is your destination file stored to? Hard drives. And you can bottleneck really quickly. When you think about it, a 1080p video that is compressed lossless, okay, it is compressed but lossless, is around 850 megabits per second. 850 megabits per second. That's a lot. That's over 100 megabytes per second. That can easily max out an older hard drive. And that's one source file. You don't only have one source file. You have multiple source files because, you know, you cut, you cut back and forth between different ones, and you, you know, skip, and then you have audio files, and so on. So your hard drive, if you're using a classical hard drive, it has a read-write hat that has to go all over the place to all the different places to collect all the data to get it into order. So you don't even reach the maximum write, read speed of your hard drive. Now, it gets even worse when you're writing to the same drive. When you're reading your source files from the same drive and writing your destination files to the very exact drive, then you will hit a performance bottleneck really, really, really quickly. What can you do to get around that? Number one, native command queuing. In your BIOS, in this S8 controller, you should have S8 mode AHCI enabled. That enables native command queuing, which means that the read-write hat path is optimized. So it doesn't just go to different things in order, uh, in, the, in the order that it receives the, the commands from. It actually calculates the shortest path between all of them. So that saves time. That makes it a little bit faster, especially when you're reading a lot of different files at the same time, which you are doing when you do video encoding. So that's really important. If you have your operating system already installed and AHCI is not on, that's problematic because you cannot just turn AHCI on because the AHCI drivers are not installed. So your operating system wouldn't boot. For Windows, you can install the Windows AHCI fix it and hope that it works. But usually what you have to do is you have to make sure you activate it before you actually install your operating system in the first place. Number one, native command queuing, kind of important. Number two, you could just get SSDs, in theory, because SSDs don't have mechanical components. They can read every part of the SSD basically instantaneously, so there's no, there's no big delay because you know, you're reading a lot of different files, but they are really expensive at the moment, especially when we're talking about really big files, like source files. Again, lossless compressed 1080p, that's 100 megabytes for every single second. You can fill up a big SSD really quickly with that. And it's probably not worth it. Especially, you know, because you have a lot of big source files, you know, if you produce a lot of videos, and an SSD doesn't like to be written to too much. So for source files, you should still get normal hard drives. But how do we get around this bottleneck that I talked about? Well, here we go. I know it's a revolutionary idea, but you should have more than one hard drive. You shouldn't have all your destination files and source files on one hard drive. You should spread it out over multiple hard drives. You need at least, in the very, very, very least, 
three hard drives in the very least three you probably want to have more than like six that would be ideal but here's what you should do you should have a hard drive for your system that is where your operating system is installed and where your video editing software is installed that can be an ssd then you want to have one destination disk and you want to have one source disk at least this way when your video is encoding it's reading from one disk and writing to another so that already helps that means the read write head does not have to skip you know back and forth that much if you want an ideal setup you can go even further. In an ideal setup, you should have an SSD for your system, an SSD for the cache of your video editing software. Then you should have two really fast hard drives as destination drives in RAID 0. RAID 0 basically combines the two drives so they act as one. Data is stripped between both drives, so half of the data is written to one drive, half of the data is written to another drive. This results in twice the space, twice the read and write speed. But it also means when one hard drive fails, all the data is gone. You cannot use any of it anymore, it's gone. Because of that, a RAID 0 is not a permanent solution, it is a temporary solution. You only put your source files on there because it's so fast. It is so, so, so very fast and you will not bottleneck it. You can even buy smaller hard drives that are really fast. You can buy two pretty small 10,000 RPM hard drives, both 500 gigabytes, and you have one terabyte of space, and it has a ridiculous read speed. Maybe around 300, 400 megabytes per second. That's really good. You can achieve that. You should also get an actual RAID controller, because the RAID controller has a cache that is also really important if you're, write, if you're reading a lot of different files. So that is for your source files. Okay, that's for your source files. Again, a RAID, RAID 0 is only temporary. It's only a work drive, basically. Don't, don't use it for storage. That's not what it's meant for. But it gives you a lot of speed for a pretty cheap price. Okay, that's good. So now we have four. SSD for system, SSD for cache, and a RAID 0 for your source files. For your destination files, you only need one hard drive. Why? Well, because you compress it, right? And as I said, 1080p lossless is around 840, 850 megabits per second. Uh, 1080p compressed is around 20 megabits per second. And that is something that every hard drive can handle. So just get a really big hard drive and et voila. Still, that is not archiving, right? Make backups. Make backups. Really important. So that's it for hard drives. That's a point that a lot of people who are new to this whole video encoding thing tend to oversee that you need a lot of hard drives and uh, that you need to think intelligently about what files you put where. You cannot just put everything anywhere. Next on is CPU. Now, that's a little bit tricky for me because I, you know, I cannot give you a specific CPU recommendation because by the time you're watching this video, it's most likely outdated anyway. But there isn't really a single specification you can look at and say, okay, that means it's better at video encoding. It's not like, yeah, you know, this is half a gigahertz more, so it's better at video encoding. It's not that easy. Basically, the most expensive ones are the best ones. That is almost all I can say about this. Usually, Intel CPUs have a little bit more power than AMD CPUs, processing power that is, and uh, you should also get as many cores as you can. You should also get, if you can, a CPU with hyper-threading, that's an Intel technology, whereas each physical core is split into two virtual cores, and that really helps with getting the m most out of your processor. One more thing, though, Something that a lot of people don't, don't see, don't know. Today, there are usually CPUs, and there are CPUs who are unlocked for overclocking. They are the same CPUs. They come from the same wafer. They have the same amount of transistors. It's all the same. But here's what's actually happening. When a wafer, where all the CPUs are on, right, a silicon wafer, comes out of the fab, 
the CPU manufacturers test each single one because they are a little bit different, right? We're talking about microscopic nanometer differences here. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. Really, really microscopic differences, little crystal defects, a transistor that isn't 100% perfect, right? That happens. And that's, you know, so there's a little difference from CPU to CPU. And when the CPU manufacturers test, let's say they have a hexa-core CPU, a CPU with six cores, and they see, oh yeah, one core is damaged on this specific CPU, they just knock out two and sell it as a quad-core. That's what they do. Or when they do a quad-core and they see, yeah, one is damaged, they knock out two and sell it as a dual-core. Stuff like that actually happens. And what they also do is they test each single one and the best ones, the choice ones from the batch, but when we're talking about Intel, they get a K at the end. And that means they are unlocked for overclocking because they are the most reliable ones of the whole batch. They are the best ones. The choice part, the A plus parts. And the rest is sold as normal CPUs. So if you get a CPU that's actually unlocked for overclocking, it means it is the best out of the whole batch. And it's more reliable. Sure, you can overclock it if you want, but even if you do not overclock it, it's still better. Because it was tested as the best. Also, you should always buy boxed CPUs, and then buy a, a better cooler, obviously, but you should buy a boxed CPU, because they have a longer warranty. Lastly, RAM. Well, RAM is really, really cheap, so there is no reason to not get just as much as you can. I have 16 gigabytes, for example. 8 gigabytes probably is the minimum. There's no reason not to get as much as you can because it's really cheap. But what RAM should you get? Should you get the uh, Kingston Value RAM DDR1333 for 30 euros per stick? Or should you get the Ultra Hyper whatever CL112666 RAM? Well, fast RAM does make a difference, but if you have the choice to invest 100 more euros into your RAM or 100 more euros into your CPU, invest it into your CPU. You get more bang for the buck this way. Getting really good RAM only makes sense if your the rest of your machine is really, really high end anyway. It gives, you, it gives you a performance increase, yes, but the performance increase is pretty small. It is smaller than the performance increase you get from investing more money into different parts of the computer, like the CPU or even the hard drives. But yes, getting faster RAM will make your video encoding faster. What kind of RAM to get? Well, there are basically three things that tell you how fast RAM is. First of all is the type. At the moment of this recording, it's currently DDR3. Next version is DDR4, which should be out soonish. Basically, when you get a new motherboard, which you probably will, it has the newest version anyway. You should always get the newest version. Then the next part is the clock rate. That is this 1333, 1666, 2666, and so on. Higher is better, usually. It's faster. But, you know, you do not necessarily need the highest. For example, I use DDR1333, CL9, and that's okay. I don't have the fastest CPU available to me, so it didn't make any sense for me to buy the really, really, really expensive 2666 RAM. But yeah, it's faster. And finally, CL. Basically, it's the latency of the RAM, but it's also coupled to the clock rate, so lower is not necessarily better. Uh, DDR3 2666CL11 is faster than DDR3 1333CL9. So what do you do to get the fastest RAM possible? It's pretty easy. So first of all, you go into the highest clock rate category you can find. For example, for DDR3, that's 2666. And then you just take the one with the lowest CL number. That is the fastest possible, basically. But you really have to think about whether or not it's, it's worth it. Finally, you can get RAM with ECC. That is error correction. That is usually the stuff that's used in servers. Doesn't make sense for video encoding. Not really. 
No, not really. If my if you have a, you know if you have a RAM error and because of that you lose a frame or something and it really bothers you this one frame of the millions that you and you just lost, and you can just re-encode, usually, and if it really was because of an error in RAM, it's gone. It's not like we're talking about super important databases here that need to be, you know, that need to be right. You do not need ECC RAM. And on top of that, ECC RAM is not as fast as the fastest Studio 3 RAM that you can get. My name is Will Mad Max. Thanks for watching this lecture. And see you next time.